We've got a special treat for you today. Pastor Marisa is bringing that word. Amen. And how many of you know uh, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So let's welcome the woman of God, Pastor Marisa, as she brings the word today. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, Pastor Rohan has already welcomed uh, the world. Hello, world. Hello, world. To my church family that's in the house of God, glad to be in the house of God. David said, I was glad when they said unto me. I don't know if I've been ever more glad to come to the house of God than today. And so today we welcome the world to the house of God. Um, this is um, uh, something we've not seen before. Uh, there are empty stadiums that seat 100,000 people empty today. There are stadiums that seat 30,000 that are empty today because there's no sporting events happening. There are places that have hundreds of soccer fields with no people on them because we can't gather. So today we say, hello world. And the Bible says that what the enemy means for bad, God will turn it around and use it for his good. And so what the enemy has thought that would turn us and get us to separate and uh, 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 isolate ourselves, now the world is not busy. And now the world is not distracted. There's no place for you to go. So hello world. Welcome to the kingdom of God, where the feast of the Lord is going on. We say hello world. Hallelujah. Welcome to the greatest message that's on the face of the earth. Let's pray and let's get, get into it. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your omnipresence and we thank you for your omnis omniscience. Father, we thank you that you are the God of the universe. You're the creator of heavens and the earth. Today we gather in your name. The name that is above every name. The name that every knee will bow and tongue will confess that your son Jesus is Lord. Now, Father, Holy Spirit, teach us that not even a fool can error. Holy Spirit, make our words like honey to draw men to yourself. Father God, thank you that your word is like a hammer to break up everything that's standing in the way. Thank you that your word today is a scalpel. It will go into those fine places, Father God, and do minute surgery. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, light today. Shine your light in dark places today. Shine your light where people and give people a path to come out. Father, we give you all the glory. Father, we give you all the praise. Father, we welcome you in this place. And Father God, we welcome you in the world today. Come, Lord Jesus, be done thy will in the earth today. Let every preacher preach with passion all over the world today. Hallelujah. Let the word of God go forth with power, with might, and in demonstration. We give you the glory and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone say it. Amen. Now come on and take out your Bible. Take out your device wherever you read your Bible front. Take it out. We never come to the house of God without our sword. Never, ever, never. We never go a day without using this sword. The way we use this sword is by reading it. And you heard Minister Tommy refer to it, reading it out loud. This is how we use the sword. Take your Bible, take your device and hold it up in the name of Jesus. Shake it so I can see it. Shake it so I can see it. Shake that and so the devil can see it. Amen. It doesn't do any good to lay on top of your coffee table just on your favorite scripture but you got to take that favorite scripture and get it on the inside you got, you got your bible repeat after me say this is my bible it is the word of god i am what it says i am i have what it says i have i am a believer and i am a doer not just a hearer i believe the word of god faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, the word of God and I am the better, am the better. after having heard the word, the word of faith amen let's get into it amen praise the name of Jesus well we're here today um, after having lived through a week that I don't know if we've ever seen before I know in my lifetime I haven't some we have some people in the house we have some people joining us online live that perhaps have lived through some things like this but in my lifetime I've not seen this before. I've, uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in the United States of America on the northern continent, and I've never seen a time where us being able to gather in the name of Jesus in a place of worship was going to be a question. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. 
And so after we've received all of these reports and information during the course of the week, we find ourselves in a place where we're thinking about a disease that perhaps a vaccination has not been formed yet. And it's caused some concern because those who are in the medical field, they're saying, we're trying to get ahead of it because we need to find out how it's, uh, how it's transmitted. So I think they, uh, they found that out. But now how do we cure it? Glory to God. Amen. And so today here in, um, here in America and all, or well, here in America, I have to speak, here in America, uh, there were questions where uh, if the saints of God were going to be able to gather. And here in America, there were various and hundreds, thousands of pastors and leadership teams that had to make decisions, very difficult decisions. For here in America, there were some areas and cities in our nation where, where schools were closed and they're now shut down. So imagine all of the churches that rent spaces in, in schools today, they had no place to worship. They had no place to gather. If there were uh, churches or bodies of Christ that met in um, government buildings or, or buildings like that, perhaps their doors were closed and they had to think of another way to preach this gospel and to gather in his name. But I'm so glad that there's a place that we can come. And we've been able to gather in his name. So if you are a citizen of the United States, don't ever take this for granted another day in our lives. Yeah. For life as we have known, it may have changed. Yeah. So I want to make sure that as I'm speaking to the body of Christ today and as I'm speaking to the world that we get some, some things straight. So we want you to know all over the world this, this virus, this is not the work of God. Amen. This is not God's doing. The Bible says that he, Jesus, has come, that Jesus has come to give us life and to give us that life more and everlasting. The Bible says that the Father God wishes above all things that we prosper, be in health, even as our souls prosper. So if God the Father desires us to be in health, he has no sickness to give. Amen. Let me uh, make sure we create some, uh, correct some thinking as well, that God doesn't teach us through sickness and disease. Amen. Neither does God teach us through death. The Bible says that God teaches us, he chastises those he loves with his word. So he doesn't have to put you in a car accident to get your attention. He doesn't have to lay you flat on your back with a virus to get your attention. He gets your attention because he's a loving and a heavenly father, a loving father. He gets our attention with his word. But the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, somebody say the thief. The Bible says the thief comes, and when a thief comes, he has one thing in mind. When a thief comes to your house, he has one thing in mind. He's coming to take something. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and that you might have that life how? More abundantly. So I want to say to the body of Christ here at Compassion, and I want to say to the world at large, as we look at this coronavirus, this is not the work of God. So as you're sitting around your tables talking to your children, as you're sitting in your cubicles at work, as you're uh, doing your workout routine, don't buy into the lie that this is the work of God. And you know God, he's just trying to tell us something. He tells us everything he wants us to know right here. It's not a mystery. If it was a mystery, he wouldn't have put it in print. So everything that God wants us to know, he has put it in print. This is not the work of God, but this is the work of the enemy. But I'm so glad that God never plays catch up. The Bible says that from the beginning of the world, God preordained and foreordained what he would do. The Bible says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says that he knows our beginning from our end and everything between. So even this did not catch God off guard. God knew about it. I don't play catch up. I put the vaccination in the earth and I put the remedy in the earth and I sent the inoculation before it even showed up. So today, we just want to talk about, we want to reveal the great inoculation. Are you ready? Yeah. The great inoculation. Let's go to the Word of God. So in Genesis 15, chapter 1, 15, chapter 15, verse 1, Genesis 15, 1, uh, the words that are most spoken by God in the Bible are fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Be of good courage. Fear not. The words most spoken by God are the words Fear not and don't be afraid. We see these words spoken for the very first time by God to a man named Abram. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. You have to say amen? amen. Genesis 15, 1. Let me find that. 
Genesis 15 and 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your what? Exceedingly great reward. I like the way it reads in the GNT uh, translation. The Father God said, Do not be afraid. I will shield you from danger and give you a great reward. So I say to those who are in the earth today, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He is your personal Savior, God says to you and God says to me today, do not be afraid. Why do you think it's so important that the people of God do not be afraid, do not get afraid? Because fear and faith cannot coexist. So the Father God knows if my creation gets into fear, their faith will not work. Body of Christ, I say to you today, this is our finest hour. And because this is our finest hour, we must stay into faith. That's why we can't afford to lean into what the media is saying. We can't afford to be the carriers of that. But we must be the carriers of this gospel. So when they start talking fear, we start talking faith. When they start saying it's not enough, we start saying there's surplus. When they're saying that there's sickness all over the land, we said that he is the Lord God that healeth us. His name is Jehovah Rapha. When they say we don't know how we're going to make it, the Bible says I am your shield and I am your great reward. When they start talking fear, you and I must talk faith. But it's not enough believers for us to talk faith when we get into here. More importantly, we must talk about faith when Pastor Roland said, when we're going about our way. Just in the normal parts of our life, our normal routines, we can't afford to get in the car and start talking about faith. We can't afford to get in the house around the table uh, and talking about fear. We can't afford to get in the, around the table and start talking around fear. We can't afford to get at our jobs and start chiming in with fear. We must. Somebody say must. Must. We must speak faith. So today uh, we have four children, as many of you know, and I remember the days uh, when they were between the ages of two and five, and I remember, you know, uh, making those doctor appointments with their pediatricians and having to take them to get their vaccinations. Anybody, you guys remember those days? I I remember those days, and I remember, you know, of course, uh, my mother had had children 20 years plus prior to me having children, so when I would bring the baby back from the pediatrician's office and had given them their vaccinations, uh, you know, they would give, you know, three, four vaccinations at a time. My mother would say, whoo, why they give those babies that many vaccinations at one time? I said, mm-hmm, I was a new mother. I just let them do what they said <laughs> it was supposed to happen. She said, ooh, when I had my babies, you know, I guess they made them bring them in one vaccination at a time. But when we had our children, they would give multiple vaccinations at one time. I want to talk to you about the today. What is a vaccine? I think they're going to have it up there for me as well to help you so you can get it into your notes. What is a vaccine? A vaccine is a biological preparation that provides active acquired immunity. What does the word biological mean? Biological means living. So when you go and get a vaccination, they put something in your body that's living. They call it, call it a biological or a living preparation. It's a preparation that is, look at the key words, active. If something is active, it means it's moving. So when they give you this vaccination, they're putting something that's living in your body, that's moving, and it's going into the body to do one thing. What is the vaccination going into the body to do? It's going in to acquire immunity. Now, what does the word acquire mean? The word acquire, I looked it up, and it said to buy something or an asset for oneself. So when they shoot the babies up with the vaccination, they shoot it up with something living that's moving that has one purpose and one purpose alone is to go in and acquire immunity for that baby or for that child, for that person. What is immunity? Immunity is the ability for an organism to resist. Somebody say resist. The immunity is the ability for an organism to resist. What do we want the organism to resist? We want the organism to be able to resist infection. Somebody say infection. Now, how does 
This vaccination work in the body. This living thing that is moving, that has one purpose, and that one purpose is to go and acquire, to buy an asset for itself. How does this thing uh, accomplish that? It accomplishes an immunity by the sensitized white blood cells. When the vaccination is administered, it is a living thing that is moving, sent in the body to acquire, to buy, to get something for oneself, and that's immunity. What is immunity? We want to be able to resist infection. How does it work? It works by my white blood cells being sensitized. We said the great inoculation. What is inoculation? You didn't know you was coming to a medical class, did you? I didn't know God was going to give it to me in medical terms. Lord, let somebody else, let the doctors tell them. Let a spiritual Holy Ghost filled doctor tell it. This is how he gave it to me. So what is inoculation? What is inoculation? Because here at Compassion, we've been confessing that we have our inoculation. We've been confessing Psalm 91 as our inoculation against anything that will come against us. So what is inoculation? Inoculation is the introduction. Somebody say introduction. It's the introduction of the vaccine. So the vaccine is what they're putting in, but the way they do it is through inoculation. I got any nurses? I got some medical folks in the house, right? I'm, am I right? Y'all, I'm not with it. Okay, come on, y'all, help me. So inoculation is the introduction of the vaccine into the body to produce the immunity. So we have a vaccination, yes? And we have a, a way that the vaccination is placed into the body, and that's called inoculation, okay? So let's talk about this. So in order for inoculation to work, it has to, um, it has to meet certain requirements. There's four of them, but I want to talk about three of them today. Is that okay? In order for inoculation to work, there's three requirements that it must meet. Are you ready? The first requirement is that the pathogens must pre be present in all cases of the disease. So there can't be a person who has the disease and you have these path pathogens, but you have the disease and you don't have these pathogens. Then this inoculation is not going to work. The inoculation will only work where the pathogens are throughout the entire disease, every case. Okay? Number one. Number two, the inoculation will only work if it's been grown in a pure culture. So you know how, what do they call it? They call it a Petri dish? So you know, like in medicine and things, they take samples and they put them in the Petri dish and they put them under a microscope and they create, they create the atmosphere, they create the environment to get something to grow or they create the environment to get something to die out. The, uh, the medical science says that an inoculation will only work if it's been produced in a pure culture. Number three, an inoculation will only work, it will only be effective if it's re-isolated and shown to be, a, to, be, to be the same as it was before. So I take this, I take this whatever I'm working with, I put it in the Petri, I, I, I develop it in a pure culture, then I take it and I put it back where it was, where it was in that diseased body. I put it back and it's got to show itself as being the same as it was before I put it there. There was no changes. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't waver. There were no changes in it. It's got to meet these three requirements. This is inoculation. I submit to you today that what the world is facing today is called the disease of unbelief. Pastor Roland referred to it earlier. We are experiencing the disease of unbelief. But there is a vaccination. And it's going to be administered through an inoculation. And it won't fail. You ready? Let's go for it. The disease today, what we're experiencing in the world is the disease of unbelief. Pastor Roland said, all other sins, all other shortcomings, all other failures, the remedy is the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we fail to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no remedy for unbelief. That's why the, God took it and made it for his good. The whole world has nothing to do 
but hear about this remedy today. That the remedy for your unbelief is a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's go. Let's look at John chapter 16, verse 9. John chapter 16, verse 9. John 16, verse 9. It's written in red. Who is speaking? Jesus is speaking, and let me start with verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Number 9, he will convict the world of sin because what? He, because what? They believe not or they do not believe. This is referring to the Holy Spirit, but the Bible says when the Holy Spirit comes into the earth, his job is to convict the world of sin. And what is he convicting the world of sin? It's not how many drinks you had, how many people you slept with, how many people you cursed out, how many people you cheated, how many drugs you took, street and otherwise, how many people you scam. The Bible says that when he comes to judge, he's going to ch judge on what? That they did not what? Believe. Believe. So what the world is experiencing today is the disease of unbelief. But there is an inoculation. Yes? There is an inoculation. So let's look at, does Jesus meet the criteria of these three things that need to be in place for an inoculation to be effective. Number one, the Bible says, uh, well, medical science says that this pathogen has got to be evident in all cases. The Bible says that Jesus became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he wasn't just sin over there, but not sin over here. The Bible says he became sin for all the world. So he didn't just become sin for North America, and I'm so glad about it today, but he became sin for the seven continents of the world. For every person, every dialect, every nation, every tongue, he became sin. He didn't just take on sin, but he became, somebody said became. And the word became sin. So it meets the first criteria. He is the pathogen in every case of the disease. And I like the word, well, the, the word it used, a pathogen. I, I took the root word of that word. What is the root word of pathogen? Path. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except they come through him. So he is the pathogen today. Glory to God. Let's see if it meets a criteria number two. Number two, it said that it had to be grown in a pure culture. John chapter one, verse one said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So he was in a very pure state. Glory to God. No sickness in heaven, no disease in heaven, nothing missing and nothing broken in heaven, no lack in heaven, no anger in heaven, no disgust in heaven. He was in a pure culture. Glory to God. So he meets the second criteria. He was born, grown in a pure culture. 100% God took on the, the form of man so that he could relate to us. So he was born, grown in a pure culture. Third criteria. Medical science says that when it is re-isolated and then placed back into that disease, it must say, it must uh, have the form that it had before. The scripture says that he became sin. Who knew no sin? That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that when they took him off that cross, and I read it, I was like, whoa, this is powerful. There were certain things that were done to him so that he could meet the criteria today. Glory to God. He became sin, but the Bible says that when he got up from that grave, he said, no man take my life, but I laid it down. And since the work is now finished, he who sent me now, I'm ascending back to the Father with nothing missing in me. But you became sin, but I am the one who was once sin, and now I have risen again. So he didn't lose his form. He kept his form. He kept his character. He kept his purpose. He kept his assignment. He fulfilled his task. So he meets 
the criteria. Is it all right? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, look at it. He had to remain and keep the same form. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. You have it? Say amen. amen. Jesus Christ, the same when? Yesterday, yesterday when? Yesterday. Today and forever. forever. So after he became sin, he's the same today yesterday and forever. So Jesus meets the criteria to be an effective inoculation. So I begin to look at the word inoculation and I've already given you the definition. And so I said, okay now, so then it tells us how do you perform? How do you administer the inoculation? Let's look at it. How do you administer? I keep wanting to say the Bible, not the Bible. Medical science says, Medical science says that in order to administer inoculation, it takes place through wounding. This is medical science. It takes place through wounding. It takes place through grafting. It takes place through cutting. It takes place through slashing. So in order for an effective vaccination to get in a human being to be inoculated, there's going to be some wounding. There's going to be some grafting. There's going to be some cutting, and there will be some slashing. So I said, how could Jesus be the perfect, the great inoculation? Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53 that he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was what? Upon him and with his Oh, there it is. We are healed. And with his stripes, we are healed. So I had to start looking at these words. And so it said it takes place through wounding. And then I said, Lord, what do you mean by grafting? And it's a medical science term. It says that grafting, they do grafting with plants. They take a piece of one plant and they take another part of another plant and they graft them together. And they say when they graft them together, when they begin to grow as one, it makes the plant even stronger. I had to look at the scripture on that. I said, okay, let's go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Glory to your name, Holy Ghost. He's an awesome God. Hallelujah. John chapter 19. Look at verse 34. No, I want Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Look at Romans chapter 11, and let's look at verses 23 and 24. We're talking about this grafting. Romans chapter 11, verse 23 to, through 24. You have it, say amen. amen. And they also, if they do not continue in what? Oh, there's that big sin again. And Pastor Rowan told us, whenever you see the word if, it means it's not all up to God. That means we got a part to play. So the Bible says, if they don't continue in the unbelief, they will be what? Woo! They'll be grafted in. Come on. For God is able to what? Graft them in again. So maybe you got off. And you've been, you've been, you've been growing in the garden of Beelzebub. You've been growing in Satan's garden. You've been letting Satan groom you. And you've been letting Satan prune you. And you've been letting Satan shape you. The Bible says if you will discontinue in your unbelief, God is able to graft you in again. Look at verse 24. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, my God, my God, you know this is a symbol of Jesus. So if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary. Some of us got away from our foundation. Some of us have gotten away with what we were taught. I'm talking to the world today. Some of you were raised by the admonition and the fear of God. And your mother and your father did what was necessary. And they told you the way of righteousness. But you and your own understanding, you have decided to go your own way. And you think that you know more than the God that we serve. 
But I'm here to tell you today, some of you have gotten wild in your grafting, but the Word of God says you've been contrary in nature unto the cultivated olive tree. Said, and were grafted contrary to your nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? God is sending out a, a signal today. And he's having us to cry out loud today. And he said, I want you back into your original olive tree. He said, I'm able, if you will discontinue in your unbelief, I'm able to bring you back and graft you in again. And the medical science says when you take one of one plant and you take something of the other plant and you put them together, they become stronger. I'm here to tell you today, you think you're strong in yourself. But if you'll yield yourself to the living God, if you submit your will to the God, the Father of the heaven and earth, you'll become stronger than you ever knew that you could be. He is able to graft us in again. So an effective occultation takes place through wounding. He was wounded for our transgressions. It takes place through grafting. He wants to take you and put you back with the original olive tree. Is that all right? It takes place through cutting. It takes place through cutting. Now we can go to John. Come on. John chapter 19. Look at verse 34. Are we learning today? Are we receiving today? Oh yes. John chapter 19. Look at verse 34. Start with verse 32. You have it. Say amen. amen. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with them. So let's talk about this. Jesus was not crucified by himself on that particular day. The Bible says that he was placed between two thieves. And these were not people that they thought were thieves. They were known thieves. And so he was placed between two thieves. And look how religious folks do. Now, you religious people, you wanted him crucified. Even Pontius Pilate didn't feel comfortable. He said, let me go ahead and give you Barabbas. Y'all know Barabbas act up. Go ahead and do what Barabbas would you. No, no, set Barabbas free. Religion. Set Barabbas free. We want him. Mm -hmm. So religious people asked for his crucifixion. And so he was crucified between two thieves, the Bible says. But here come religious people. Ooh, ooh, the Sabbath is coming. It's important how we look. Now, y'all know y'all just done bloodied him up on Thursday and Friday. You, 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 you know that. But the Sabbath is coming, and it just won't look good having folks up on the cross dead. So come on and bring them down. So they said that, well, they may not be dead yet. You know, it takes time for the blood to fill up the lungs in order to die in a crucifixion. So they may not be dead yet. So the Bible says, this is what you're reading, that the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the second. The thieves, they weren't dead yet. They still had a little life in them, but because the religious folks, they wanted to look bad on Sunday, bring them down. They went ahead, the soldier said, and broke their legs. And when they broke their legs, what happened when the arms were like this, when you broke the legs, they were like this, and the lungs filled up, killed them. Now bring them on down. But they said when they got ready, come on, read it. Who was crucified with him, 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already what? He was already dead. They did not do what? Break his legs. Now, why was that important? Verse 34 says, but one of the soldiers did something. One of the soldiers did what? Pierced his side with a what? With a spear. And immediately, what happened? Blood and water came out. Come on, let's keep reading. Verse 35, and he who was seen has testified. And his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth. Look, they're saying, we know you're telling the truth. Watch this. Because we got something to refer back to. Watch this. We know you're telling the truth so that you may believe. Verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Well, what was the scripture? The scripture said not one of his bones shall be what? broken. So when they came, he was already dead because the scripture, oh, I told you God is never catching up. He knows the end from the beginning. The Bible says that when he goes through this crucifixion, when he is a sufferer for the mankind, when he goes through this, I'm going to let everything happen, but not one bone of his body will be broken. Come on, let's read it. Verse 37. And again, another scripture says, they shall look up on him who was what? Pierced. So that soldier, he didn't know scripture, but he went and pierced them. He didn't know he was fulfilling scripture. They said an effective oculation takes place through wounding. 
Ineffective oculation takes place through grafting. Ineffective uh, inoculation takes place through cutting. He was peers. I tell you, he's a great inoculation. Then ineffective inoculation takes place through slashing. Let's go back to Isaiah. Glory to God. Let's go back to Isaiah 53. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Isaiah chapter 53. Hallelujah. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was where? Upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And so those stripes are not, you better, come on Jesus. You better come on, carry that cross on up this hill so we can put you up there. Come on Jesus, these little stripes. Like I see my little, my little parents that are got you I'm going to get you. I said, that ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, mm-hmm. he'll be back tomorrow doing the same thing. You better stop that. Oh, no. The Bible says there were many lashes. So I looked up the word slashes, and one of the, one of the synonyms was lashes. The Bible said that there were many lashes placed upon him. And it wasn't something little cute, little smooth, little something... We don't want to leave no marks. No, 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 no. The Bible said that it had cat, 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 cat what? Cat and nine tails. So when it hit his back, so what? And when they pulled it, it ripped the flesh from his back. I said an effective inoculation takes place through cutting. An effective inoculation takes place through wounding. An effective inoculation takes place through grafting. And an effective inoculation takes place through slashing. There was nothing that was done to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That was happenstance, coincidental. Everything was on purpose that the scripture might be fulfilled. That today in March 2020, the world and you and I will have an opportunity to receive this great inoculation. You want to be able to confess Psalm 91 like we confess Psalm 91? Turn to Psalm 91 and pull out your paper, Psalm 91. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 91. Where's my paper? Glory to God. Let's just look at that again because now you're going to have a, even more of an understanding. Psalm 91. Oh, glory to God. The great inoculation. We're not waiting for it. It's already come. Over 2,000 years ago. The inoculation for this disease and any to come. Those that have a name and they that, those that don't have a name. The great inoculation has already come. Yeah. Now you just got to receive it. Yeah. You just got to go into the doctor's office and get it. Yeah. The church, the four walls is the hospital. Yeah. Just come on in and receive it. Yeah. Come on in and get it. Psalm 91 says that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, you heard Pastor Roland preach it. You heard Minister Tommy preach it, but I just want to give you an insight into that first verse. In the Hebrew, the Bible says that word, he who dwells, that word means sits. He who sits in the secret place. Miss Tommy said that her daddy would take her down to the basement. I don't think they were standing in the basement the whole time waiting for her, her daddy to take all is clear. But they got in there, started sitting down, eating their snacks. The Bible says he who sits in the secret place. What does the word sit signify? Huh? What does it signify? Rest. So the Bible says, he who rests. It sounds like the same scripture said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God. Hallelujah. So don't let the media get you anxious. Don't let the media get you frantic. Don't let the media get you to scurry. Because Psalm 91 says, he who sits in the secret place. When you sit, it means you're getting ready to stay a while. Girl, let me sit down. What you talking about? When you sit, you're getting ready to spend some time. The Bible says, he who sits 
in the secret place. But that secret place, we got to find out where that secret place is. It's a secret place. That means everybody doesn't know him. It's a secret place. That means Satan doesn't know him. That means if I'm sitting in the secret place, he can't find me. The Bible said, I will hide you, hallelujah, in the cleft of the rock. Glory to God. I'm in a secret place. But you say you're in America. We see you right now. But I'm in a secret place. This day I told y'all. I'm in a secret place, right? And so I'm hidden. The Bible said, he who sits in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. Miss Tommy had to do the shadow. Under the shadow. Do it again. Under the shadow of the Almighty. That in the Hebrew says, when you're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, that means you're spending the night. So when the Hebrew people read that, they say, spend the night. So he who sits in the secret place of the Most High shall spend the night. <laughs> darkness all around. Darkness all around. The Bible said that when there was darkness in Egypt, which represents the world system, there was light in Goshen. Well, I'm going to let you know what Goshen means in Hebrew. Goshen, the word Goshen in Hebrew means to draw near. So when there was darkness in the world, there was light in Goshen because the people of God had drawn near. How do we know that they had drawn near? Because they obeyed the disciples and they, they obeyed the instructions of the Lord. Said, take that lamb and roast it. And when you roast it, make sure you get the blood from it. When you get the blood, put the blood on the top of the doorpost and put the blood on the sides of the doorpost and when the de death angel comes I'll recognize the blood and when I see the blood I'm going to cross on over you glory to God so I'm in the secret place where I cannot be found and when he sees the blood he's got to cross all over me coronavirus when you see the blood you got to cross all over me is that right going, up, going around uh uh you can't come here because a thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand but it shall not come nigh me only with my eye shall I see the reward of the wicked he who dwells he who sits, he who sits, he who sits, where, uh, uh, look at somebody say, where are you sitting? Oh, it's time now to make sure you got your seat. Where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Because he who sits in the secret place, that hidden place of the most high, shall abide. Somebody say, spend the night. Tell somebody, stay a while. Yeah, we in this for the journey. Hallelujah. We're not in it to see what the end's going to be. We already know what the end's going to be. That's why we're so excited because the Bible says, when you begin to hear of wars and rumors of wars, when you begin to hear of pestilence, and when you begin to hear of famines, and when you begin to hear of these things, fear not, it is only the beginning to the end. Somebody say, stay a while. Stay a while. Come on, say, stand to your feet. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to your name, Father God. Hallelujah, Father. We have decided that we will sit in the secret place. We have decided that we will dwell. We'll spend the night. We'll spend the night, Father God. With darkness all around, we'll spend the night in your presence. We'll spend the night under your covering. He who sits in the secret place of the Most High shall spend the night under the shadow of the Almighty. Come on, say to God, let's pray. Father, thank you for this living word. Thank you that you haven't left us to ourselves. Thank you that this word is alive, true, producing, establishing us in you. Father, we thank and we praise you. Now, Father, if there's anyone in our midst who has not received the grace.